Well, I want to turn you to that passage that I, I read, um, uh, Psalm, and look at the words particularly in uh, chapter 43. Uh, the prophet Isaiah lived in the years prior to Judah's final overthrow by the Babylonians and their being carried away into captivity. Uh, God's judgment was being prophesied by Isaiah. Uh, but the stubbornness of the people towards this message is seen in the first part of our reading and in so many other places. In chapter 42 we read, didn't we? Hear you deaf and look you blind that you may see. Who is blind but my servant? Or deaf as my messenger whom I send? Or again in verse 24, who gave up Jacob to the looter and Israel to the plunderers? Was it not the Lord against whom we have sinned, in whose ways they ha would not walk, and whose law they would not obey? So he poured on him the heat of his anger and the might of battle. It, it set him on fire all around, but he did not understand. It burned him up, but he did not take it to heart. The people were following their own ways. They refused God's correction. And they were uh, going to go into uh, captivity. But the faithful few, the faithful remnant, I wonder if in their minds and in their hearts there were questions like, would God now abandon them completely? Would the exile be the end of God's people? Would the nation cease to exist? That, that tiny group who still sought to worship God uh, alone and to serve him faithfully. The total abandonment of the people was what they deserved for way they, the way they had be, behaved. And yet as we, we come into chapter 43, we find that the, the two chapters are linked together. There's that word but. In, in verse 43, linking us back to what's gone before. But the connection is altogether a surprise. He says, rather than destroy them completely, that he will preserve them. That in spite of their stubbornness and their sin, God's people would yet continue to know his love and his care. We see this in these opening verses of, of chapter 3. God's mercy and, and kindness and grace, they shine out from the page. Uh, uh, it's Matthew Henry, the, the great Puritan commentator, who says these first verses of, of four, chapter 43 are like the sun breaking out from behind a thick, dark cloud. And it shines all the brighter and with a pleasing surprise. Was rather than the, the message of judgment continue, uh, what Isaiah brings or what God brings through Isaiah is a message of comfort, a message of God's continued favour towards that faithful remnant, the true spiritual seed of Abraham and the patriarchs. Uh, but this was a message, first of all, to the people of Isaiah's day. So what does it have to say to us today, uh, here in Clidach and in, in Wales. Well, uh, I suppose there's no book like Isaiah uh, for pointing forward to a kingdom yet to come. Uh, Isaiah, above all the prophets, has that, that message of the, the servant of the Lord, the suffering servant, the one who, by whom salvation would come to all nations. Uh, it, it's what we're going to be, what we are in the midst of celebrating, isn't it? Unto a us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The promise of the coming Messiah. And in the light of this, we can surely say with the writer to the Hebrews that this good news came to us just as to them, here is good news for God's people today. For we are Abraham's seed.
by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Every true believer, every company of God's people, we can take these promises and apply them to ourselves in our day and age and in the society uh, in which we live. Uh, like that faithful remnant of old, we might feel in, in the day and age in which we live that the church is, is weak, that we are a remnant. Uh, so much of the outward professing church, never mind the world outside, has rejected God's word and the gospel's claims. The Lord Jesus Christ is dishonoured rather than worshipped. And we might feel that we are a, a remnant along with other faithful companies of God's people who are seeking to proclaim his word and proclaim the gospel. But even we surely are, are aware that we, we're not what we ought to be. Uh, it may be a, as a nation that we might be called to experience God's judgment because of the way our nation is behaving. But the Lord comes to us tonight, just as he came uh, to the people in Isaiah's day, and he says to us, as he said to them, fear not. He says it in verse 1, fear not. And again in verse 5, fear not. In the light of all these things, God makes this bold declaration, this bold call to us as his people today as he did to the people of Isaiah's day fear not and he doesn't just say that and leave it like that he, he unpacks those two simple words and gives us the reasons why we should not fear and I want to look at those with you now so firstly in verse 1 we need not fear because we, as God's people, are his workmanship. Now, verse 1 says, But now, thus saith the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not. That's the first uh, reason not to fear, because we are God's workmanship. He goes on, I have redeemed you, I have called you by name. You are mine. And we have here, uh, as it were, a lot of reasons within the first reason. He says, he who created you, O Jacob. It is God who has made us. Now, we, we believe, don't we, that when God first created all things, then we were part of that creation. Man was part of that creation. Everything originated in him. And it is God now who upholds and maintains and sustains and directs his creation. But Isaiah's words here are not speaking of that creation. He's speaking in more intimate terms to his people. These words have a deeper meaning. We as God's people and God's people down the ages exist. Not out of anything we have done. It is God who has called us as the church into being. It was his eternal purpose uh, to choose a people for himself. And he has created us. He has gathered us. He watches over us. He cares for us. He protects us. And so he says to us, fear not. But then he goes on and he says, I have formed you, he who formed you, O Israel. Now, on first reading, we might think this is just a repetition. But the, the word uh, formed, we, we translate formed us, is, is not simply repetition. It's a more intimate description of God's activity. It, it's a word which speaks of the painstaking care that is taken over something being made. Uh, somebody has described it like this, as, as a potter at work. Uh, the potter knows the end he has in mind. He knows the right pressure to apply to the mould as he has the clay between his hands. 
And it is in this sense that God has formed us. He is the one who has made us. He has not simply created us, but he watches over us. His great care and love weighs and measures all the circumstances of his people's lives to form us into a people for his glory. So again, he says to us, fear not. But then this description becomes more intimate again. He, he says, I have redeemed you. Now, I'm sure you all know the story of, of Boaz and of Ruth. Uh, and Boaz took on the role of Ruth's kinsman redeemer. And in so doing, he made all the, her needs, all her hopes, all her cares, his own. He took everything that lay on Ruth and made them his own. And what a comfort uh, it is to every believer in all our weakness and helplessness to know that the Lord has stepped in and made all our concerns his own. And so he says to us, fear not. Then comes the, the high point of this description of his workmanship of this uh, intimate relationship he's entered into with us as his people and he says I have called you by name you are mine here we have the closest of relationships uh, we have re re reflected first of all the love of the parent and the child he says here uh, I have called you by name that's the prerogative isn't it of the parent but then he goes on and he says, you are mine. So on the one hand, he says, I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord. But then these words, you are mine, they relate to a yet more intimate relationship. Boaz, in that story, he didn't just take on Ruth's concerns and Ruth's cares and Ruth's needs. No, he married Ruth. He took her to be his own. And here, these words speak of that intimate relationship, that marriage bond. And, and Isaiah goes on, and God says through Isaiah later in the, 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 the book, as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Fear not. So that's the first reason. We are his workmanship. He has brought us into being. He has entered into this relationship with us. But then secondly, God promises his constant presence in all circumstances. In verse 2 we read, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. From waters or oceans to rivers, from fire to the individual flame, from one extreme to the other, in all the trials and dangers of, the li of life, the promise of the Lord is that I will be with you. There's this, uh, it's not simply a, a general overall promise, although that will, will apply, that applies to the church in days when trials come on a whole nation. God promises to be with his people as a whole. When there's an overflowing uh, of, of waters like a tsunami, when some great uh, problem, some great trial falls upon the church. Or uh, some destructive power, we've seen it again and again, haven't we, on the television in recent years, of great forest fires. The promise stands, I will be with you. But also, Isaiah is pointing out here that God promises to be with us uh, as individuals. When it is but a river, when it's an individual flame. The trials that come to us perhaps separately at different times in our lives. The Lord promises his presence. 
here in this verse, we have a promise for the, the smallest daily anxiety right up to the soul-shaking experiences of life. Fear not, I will be with you. It's a promise for every kind of trial. Uh, so often fire represents persecution. And uh, we are visibly reminded of that, aren't we, in the Old Testament in the book of Daniel, when Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were, were thrown into that fiery furnace for their refusal to bow down to the great idol. Uh, and what does the uh, king say? How many did we throw into the furnace? Uh, we threw three in. Yes, but I see four walking. And one like a son of God. God says, even in the very midst of persecution, I will be with you. Fear not. And as individuals, we can feel like the floods have come upon us at times, can't we? Uh, whether it be uh, some serious illness or bereavement or financial difficulties, whether we have anxieties about loved ones, they can seem as though they are going to overwhelm us. Well, God says to us, fear not, I will be with you. In God's providence, when those trials come upon us, and in his wisdom, he does not always remove them, but we are called to go through them, then these promises of God promise us his grace, his strength uh, for the day. And he promises to uphold us. And in the face of that very last great trial, when each one of us separately are called to face uh, the last day of our lives, the Lord says, fear not, I am with you. So God has, we are God's workmanship. We are promised God's presence. But then thirdly, uh, God's people are comforted here by the knowledge that God has set a great price on them. Fear not. Why? Well, the Lord says, consider the price I have given for you. Remember what I've already done for you, God says to his people. In verse 3 we read, For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you. Because you are precious in my eyes and honoured and I love you. I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. What did God do for the people in the past? He gave Egypt up for them. He poured out his judgment on Egypt that his people might be redeemed out of slavery. And he says, I would have given nation after nation for you. Why? Because you are precious, you are honoured, and I love you. And all this, amazingly, is, is so undeserved, so unmerited. Remember what uh, God said uh, through Moses to the people after they had come out of Egypt. We read it in, in Deuteronomy. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery. He has set a great price upon them. Uh, again, we remember that uh, story of, Joab and, uh, of uh, Boaz and Ruth, don't we? Not only did he take her cares and concerns, not only did he marry her, but he paid what was called the redemption price in order to, for her to be his own. 
And this is the redemption price that, that uh, God is speaking of here. That he has given nations for his people. They need not fear. So then finally, uh, how do these promises apply to us today? Well, the promises and the prophecies, as we've said already, uh, of Isaiah look beyond his own day to a day when the Messiah would come, when a new kingdom would be established, not simply a physical nation, but a spiritual kingdom. And we see it in these verses, don't we? Uh, he says that he is going to gather the people from every corner of the earth. The whole of Isaiah is, is constantly pointing forward to the incarnation, to the crucifixion, to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. All the way to those words of the Saviour himself. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. All those whom the Father has given him will be called, will be gathered together. They are being formed into a people for his glory, gathered from every corner of the world. Remember how this part of the reading ends. Fear not, I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up. And to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. If we're God's people, Tonight, we, we're the fulfilment of that prophecy here in Clitheroe this evening. We're part of that great fulfilment, of that great gathering of God's people from every corner of the world. And all of these promises, they come to that focal point. They come to that pinnacle in the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We're told, aren't we, that all the promises of God are yea and are men in him. And these promises given on Isaiah, we see are, are expanded for us in the New Testament. Uh, Paul writes into the Ephesians in chapter 1, he says we have been called by the Father in Jesus Christ. We're told uh, again and again throughout the New Testament, what was the real great redemption price that's been paid? Well, Peter tells us, doesn't he, uh, in chapter 1 and verse 18 of his letter. Sorry. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways uh, inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without blemish or without spot that's the price that has been paid for us god has given his own son in our place he has paid the price that we deserve to pay for our sin and now in him in christ we too are called the children of god what a glorious fulfillment it is we are united to him. Uh, in, in, we are the, now the bride of Christ. Again, Paul in Ephesians makes it so clear, doesn't he? When he's speaking about marriage between a man and a woman and their responsibilities and their uh, union one with another. He says at the end, doesn't he, that ultimately this refers to Christ and the church. The presence of God is promised to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. What did the Saviour say? Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Uh, in Hebrews 13, be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And again, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me 
What a glorious thing it is to be a believer. We, we need to dwell upon the promises of God again and again and again. When we, we face the trials and the difficulties, uh, and they come, don't they? Often we, we can see them coming. Often they come totally unexpectedly. But the Lord knows. The Lord knows all things. He's molding us. He's making us. He's perfecting us. And ultimately that day will come when we will be made like the Lord Jesus Christ. But in that intervening period, these promises are ours to lay hold of. Well, may God bless them to us uh, as we come to the end of one year and begin another year not knowing what lays ahead of us. We can take these words to heart. Fear not. Uh, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by my name. By name, you are mine.